everyone, and welcome to another episode of Justin the Food Entrepreneur's Podcast. I'm Justin Bizarro. I'm your host. That's B-I-Z-Z-A-R-R-O. And today I'm here with our awesome new co-host, Skylar Rabson. How are you doing today, Skylar? I'm good. I'm ready for another show. There you go. And um, so Skylar's our new co-host. He's re- replaced Deborah, just so everyone knows, um, as she's taken on a larger role at FSP. So now we have a new co-host. And so, Skylar, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about yourself? All right. I am a student at Georgia College. Um, I've been working for FSP for a few months now, maybe eight or nine. And I just basically help you out, do whatever, and learning from you, learning a lot from you. Awesome. So um, why don't you introduce our guest today, Skylar? All right. Today we have Spencer from Spencer's Jerk and Jerky. And where is he from? Sterling, Virginia. I'll help out uh, Skylar a little bit. He's new. We're getting him warmed up. But how are you doing, Spencer? How are you doing? And welcome back to the podcast. Spencer's an OG. I think three years running now, going on year four and possibly part four, if I'm not mistaken. I'm doing good. Yeah, it is is part four. I was trying to look back um, and see what episode number they all were the first one was in the i know in the double digits i know you're past that now so yeah yeah i think excited (laughs) (laughs) so spencer let's just let's warm up the audience a little bit for anyone that may be new um who has who doesn't want to go back and re-listen to it so just give us um sort of a the quick 411 on your business uh how people get your jerky what the flavors are and sort of how um why you started a beef jerk jerky company and sorry, 411 used to be an information number. So why don't you give the information on your company? I think I just dated myself. <laughs> I'm old enough to know that one. I had a rotary phone when I was when I was a baby. So and there you, you know, go. I, I remember it a little bit. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll try to give the the more condensed version because it is a pretty pretty long story. Obviously, since we're on the fourth episode about it, right? But um, yeah, uh, back in 2018, uh, very beginning, it was February. I was just uh, working my day job and uh, saw an infomercial on one of these air fryer ovens that you could do everything uh, from a rotisserie chicken to uh, dehydrating beef jerky. So, you know, I bought the thing and it had a recipe for beef jerky that I completely tweaked because I, I wanted to make myself something that was, you know, a, a, a bit better and, you know, kind of just make myself like the best beef jerky I could possibly make, right? So, completely selfish was just trying to make myself a snack and uh, it ended up, you know, making two pounds of beef jerky that I took up to a, a local bar down the street from my house. And, uh, you know, I was just sitting in there eating it and, uh, long story short, the first two people that tried it, both ordered two pounds, um, had to figure out how much to charge them right then on the fly. And, uh, you know, a week and a half later, I was at like $650, I think it was. So I kind of had to think about what what in the world was happening you know got my llc um and then you know it's kind of kind of really grown grown from there but you know it it was a complete accident um you know always had interest in being an entrepreneur but really didn't set out to to be one let alone um you know in the the snack food uh market but um yeah so you know a year later i started my website that's you know still running um it's spencer's jerk and jerky.com um Basically, everything on there is, is made to order, you know, from visiting the butcher to purchase the steak at the time of your order, all the way to uh, the marinades I craft fresh um, using, you know, only locally sourced produce, uh, all natural ingredients. And uh, most importantly, a lot of people like to hear, you know, I don't add any sugars. There's no added sugars in my products. Yeah, that's um, amazing. You know, it, it wasn't something that I necessarily intended to do to, to market it that way. You know, again, I was just trying to make myself a snack, but uh <laughs> You know, that was my uh, that was my original flavor that I made that day. Um, hasn't really changed, you know, in the almost four years now. Um, but uh, besides that one, you know, I do have my old day one, which I know Justin loves and has talked a lot about um, just with his, his knowledge of old day and what, what a great seasoning it is. Yeah, absolutely. And then uh, I do a habanero bourbon um, that, you know, is infused with some Jim Beam bourbon. Um, also has some freshly sliced habaneros in that one. And then I have a uh, mandarin jalapeno, which kind of started out as like a, an orange chicken recipe, you know, you would get from 
um, Panda Express or something like that. And then I have a, a lemon pepper, um, which is actually the second most popular flavor this year. Um, it's pretty been pretty impressive. And then uh, every every month or so, I've been doing some salsa as well. I don't know if I was doing that at all um, when we talked at any of the other uh, any other episodes on, on your show. But no, uh, no I, nothing I, about I, the salsa. You know, I I have vegan friends, and my one my one vegan friend that I you know I partner with on some other business ventures. You know, was getting jealous because I'd send all the other guys you know beef jerky, and he doesn't eat meat. So I was like, well, I do have the salsa, you know, that I make. Um, let me send you some. I don't know if it's any good or not. I eat it. And then uh, he actually told me uh, it was the best sauce he's ever had. I had to sell it. And then uh, I figured I'd pull up the numbers while we were here. And I've sold uh, I've actually sold 87 um, jars of it, which I've made 87 jars of it. So um, works out works out well. But that's gone as far as Kuwait and Korea. Um, same with the jerky. So I've actually gotten the sauce outside the country now too. Oh, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. And so <clears throat> let's talk about how you've grown. I mean, you've stuck with it for four years, which m not many people stick with it that long. You've started off with just a website. So, I mean, and last time we talked, we were sort of, um, you know, in the midst of COVID and there, the bars were sort of not open and the breweries, which was a thriving business for you. So as that stuff's opened back up, I mean, sort of let's talk about, you know, the growth of your business, but so let's also talk about the bump in the road that you may have had during COVID. I mean, during the major part of COVID, I would say we're sort of tailing off now and opening up businesses and then what it's like now for you. Yeah, it, it was, it's, it's actually really interesting how that played out. Not really something I think I could have honestly predicted uh, to play out the way it did because um, I would probably say, half or sometimes more than half of my uh like monthly revenue used to be um those brewery events you know i always did better um you know i always during the holidays for gifts but then you know summertime up here in virginia there's so many breweries and um something we've talked about on the other episodes a bunch is that n the majority of them don't serve food you know what i mean um so uh people who are vendors barbecuers you know things like that you know make a killing you know popping up at these breweries they give you free beer all day um, and you know, I, I would sell out pretty much every time. Um, and that was, that was great. And also would find me new customers, you know, uh, really get the chance to let, you know, have strangers try it and give me an honest opinion. You know, they have no reason to lie to me at this brewery, stuff like that. So when COVID started, uh, you know, it was kind of the tail end of when the breweries really hold most of their events. So I, you know, I, luckily I had some, uh, funds saved up from that, but then honestly, it went the opposite of, you know, what I thought might've happened. Um, my businesses on my like website, you know, kind of doubled, you know, month over month for a few months there. Um, you know, maybe part of that was people getting, you know, stimulus money and having a little extra funds to play with. And, you know, maybe some of that was the, like, not so much the bars and the, uh, you know, the, uh, restaurants closing down, but just not wanting to go to the grocery store, not wanting to, you know, go out and get, you know, snack foods where now they can get something, you know, made to order delivered to their house in a week. You know what I mean? So it, it actually made my website, uh, really grow. Um, and you know, it, it ne didn't necessarily stay at that rate, uh, you know, as you know, COVID stretched on and on, but it never did back to what it was before COVID either. Um, which was, which is pretty impressive to me. I, you know, wasn't really expecting that. Yeah, and I think that in any business, particularly in food, you'll see that always. Even if you have a boom or a popularity, you just you need to wait for it to sort of level out. It's just the way it is. I'm pretty sure it's like that in other tangible businesses, but um, you'll see your consumers suck up a lot. And if you bet on that, it's always going to be at that highest point. You're going to be wrong. And so I think that there was probably a cool lesson there that you just taught all the entrepreneurs on the podcast, Spencer, which is exactly that those big fluctuations they they help do business and your business will not drop to where it was before but it won't stay at those high outputs so if you're starting to forecast at those high outputs it makes it hard to run your business for sure yeah i think uh what's most important that i learned beyond that too is it's, what's really important uh you know it obviously depends on what kind of service or product you're providing but um when you get those spikes you know how many of those customers are going to remain customers right you know my orders don't last people all that long when they're sitting there snacking, you know, they want to, they're going to order more hopefully. And, um, 
I'm like looking at it right now, you know, 30% of my orders is someone who's ordered before. So I think that's what can help you kind of, you know, not necessarily keep it at its peak, but, you know, hope that it doesn't valley as much, you know, as it potentially could. And we talked a lot on your previous podcast about how you, your loyal company, customers you'll send them extra beef jerky and stuff for them to try if you're trying a new flavor and you did monthly specials before is that something you still do yeah so there's there's been a few things um that i've started to do so um the first thing that's allowed me some more time is i did finally decide to you know take the full leap and you know resign from my my uh, my corporate job in october so um you know since october uh i've had a lot more time to focus um, and direct directly on, you know, this business and what, what it can potentially be. And um, so I'm still using a lot of my previous ideas uh, and this is allowing me to do that. And I'm starting to do a new flavor, uh, you know, if not every couple of weeks, at least once every month, I'll drop a new flavor. Now it won't stay. I still have most of those five staple flavors I already went through, but I'll, I'll drop one, you know, make about 20 pounds of it available. And then, you know, in a couple of days, that 20 pounds sells out. And then, you know, I craft that flavor for everybody. Um, what's helped me a lot with that is the average person orders uh, two pounds of beef jerky from my website at a time. Oh, and wow. typically it's typically it's two different flavors they're ordering. So I wouldn't say that it's every single customer that comes in for the first time and orders that new exclusive flavor. But I would probably say a little less than half of them do add one of the staple flavors as well. So even if they don't like the new one that much that I'm experimenting with, I know that they are going to try one of these other ones that I've been making for, you know, three plus years. So um, that's allowed me to definitely get a lot more loyal customers. And then also uh, I have customers that seem to uh, kind of wait around for the new flavor to come out and they'll buy the new flavor and then they'll always buy whatever their favorite was from the past. Um, so, that's one thing I've kind of done, but also adapted a little bit and kind of fine tuned a little bit more, um, over the past couple months. That's, that's all super interesting. Um, if I could go back for a second, was there yeah. anything that in, in particular that made you take that leap to quit your job and focus really on this? You know, it's something that was definitely, you know, in the back of my mind for a very long time. Um, Something that if you ever go back, Skylar, and listen to any of the other other episodes, and Justin can, can attest to this, something that uh, used to come up on the show and then something that used to get asked a lot of me just interacting with people is like, so when are you going to go full-time you know, with the beef jerky company? And uh, for a while, it was like, not yet, I don't know, da-da-da. Um, but then eventually my answer kind of changed to, you know what, like I already am full-time with it. I just have two full-time jobs, right? Mm. And um, honestly, it just kind of started taking a toll um, and I just one day finally decided that, you know, I know what potential the business has and, you know, I'm not giving it, you know, all the time, you know, that it deserves or that it needs, you know, to kind of get to that next level. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so th that was kind of what, like, I always knew it had the potential. So I, it was just finally getting to a point where I felt, I guess, comfortable enough, um, Financially, I knew that even if I fell flat on my face, you know, I'm not going to, uh, you know, lose my car or lose my house or something like that. You know what I mean? So I would definitely say, like, as a, as a piece of advice for anyone, you know, who finds themselves in that position, um, you know, definitely just make sure that you have, you know, a, a safety net or, you know, a, enough saved up that, you know, should something go wrong, something come up, you know, you're not going to, you know, find yourself in a spot where, you know, it's a directly affecting, you know, it, you know, your daily life, but then also like putting your business at risk at the same time. I think one of the things that's important there, Spencer, is it's something that you know you've wanted to do. We've talked about it for how long. <clears throat> and mm -hmm. so you've always been saving for it over the four years. It's always been a goal to grow your business. So everything you've been doing is sort of focused on that vision. And once it came into place, it it was a an, an easy decision or a transition just because you had been so focused on it as a goal for so long. And, and I... And I was, it was interesting to hear you say that because we had, it is totally was a question and I, and, um, and we asked it and Skylar asked it. So I just think it's so cool. Um, but the reality is, is you're right. It's something you've been focusing on for so long. I feel like you've properly built that, you know, that, that safety net for yourself, built the business up to a point where, 
you can grow it and it's comfortable and it's bringing in enough monthly revenue where you're comfortable uh, moving it forward. Exactly. And like one of the, I would say like what really started t- kind of turning it, turning it in motion. I mean, at first was definitely those first couple of months where like it just really spiked, you know, um, during that, those summer months of COVID where like my website was just going crazy. That, that definitely gave me an idea of, you know, the potential, but also I knew that there was a pandemic going on and, you know, how much of this is, you know, going to last, you know? Um, but something we talked about over the course of the, the different episodes, and I honestly can't remember, um, I feel like we, you know, I had done it by this point of last episode, but I could be wrong. But um, if you remember, one of the first things I told you on the first episode was, you know, I want to get customers in all 50 states. Yeah. Um, and I know every episode I was getting a little bit, a little bit closer, but, you know, um, that finally happened uh, last year. And that definitely had my, you know, my hamster wheels turning in my head a little bit more about it. That's um, pretty cool. You know, just knowing that I, that I was able to do that. And at the, at the same time, it's going outside the country as well. And then, you know, like I've talked to you about, and I think where you originally saw my business card was in the Virgin Islands and they still yeah. order every month. So yeah, um, that's actually, I can't, that's exactly where I saw you. That's how I, I found Spencer in the, to get recruit him on the podcast. I forgot about that. Yeah. So like of all places to find it, um, I don't know if I ever told, I don't know if I ever told this story. I'll tell it, I'll tell it real quick, but, uh, with the Virgin Island connection, I had a, a high school buddy that lives in the Virgin Islands. Um, he works at a, you know, terror sale company and he walked into one of his buddy's houses and his buddy's like, Hey, you want to try some of this beef jerky? It's really good. And he's like, Oh yeah, I love beef jerky. And he tosses in the bag and he starts eating it. And then, um, uh, my friend who's eating the beef jerky, his name's Larry. He, Larry looks down and sees my name on it. And, you know, it's not an overly common name. Um, he knew exactly who it was right away. So then all of a sudden, like I get a call on Facebook messenger cause he didn't have my like new phone number over the years. You know, it's been since high school. Um, and yeah, he just had walked into a random house. So it wasn't even like, it wasn't my friend that ordered it to get it to the Virgin Islands. It was just, you know, his buddy's house. And that That's was pretty awesome. cool. <laughs> kind of, kind of crazy too. That's amazing. And I think that that's the way it spread. So, I mean, is the next goal, like every country, uh, potentially, yeah, you know, I got to I think I got to figure out a, something with the shipping to get the shipping down. Every once in a while I get messages from people um cuz you know my website will track, you know, who's visiting and you know who puts what in their cart and stuff like that. Um but yeah, I would definitely like to, you know, to get to more countries. Um if if anything, you know, I try to get to like maybe more of the the military bases um can make it a little bit easier easier for me too. Um cuz that's why it's, it's been to Kuwait multiple times and, that, and that's how it ended up in uh, in Korea. Um I think three times now it's gone to Korea for different people. So, I mean, I think that's the next goal. That's pretty awesome. So anyone in the audience, I know we have a lot of international followers of your, of the podcast and a lot of international subscribers, um, all over the, over a hundred countries. So I think that this is a pretty cool goal. Uh, Spencer, if you're gonna now say that you have all the 50 states, let's make a push for all 50 countries. And then, you know, p- people can post it and, and do something. I think that would be pretty fun. I did say something online multiple times and it, it was kind of, a, it was kind of a joke, but so was the 50 state thing when I first started saying it. And that it was, I, I want to try to, uh, I keep trying to tag NASA on Twitter and yeah. trying to see if I can, if I can get it, or, you know, to go to the space station or, you know, I wanted to the, the, the launch off so I can claim that, you know, I don't, I don't know if anybody sent beef jerky to space yet. So, um, I know they've delivered pizza hut to the space station before. So, you know, I think that'd be pretty cool too. That'd be really cool to get the, uh, marketing videos. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, Spencer, what's, I mean, what's the next plan now you've taken this leap. It's been about two months. Um, so you're now on this wild journey. Um, how has it been for you the last two months, um, doing it? And then two, what is it? I mean, has it changed the vision of your company? Has it changed where you want to go with it or, or what you're trying to do? And, or, um, is it give you the potential to add more flavors just cause you have more time? And we talked a little bit about flavors coming in and out on special, but is it something that you're actually growing your line to have a larger, um, selection for everyone as well? Now that you have more time. Potentially, I haven't I haven't fully decided, and the only reason, um, and I think we might have talked about this before, so I can fill Skyler in on it too. Is I think one of the reasons um, that I've talked about before with why it's stuck it with the five flavors 
is because every once in a while, I still have these people that will come on and I love them for this, but they want to order one of every flavor. They're my favorite customer, but you know, um, that takes a lot longer, uh, to produce cause you know, I can only do one flavor per cooker at a time. So, um, I'm going to have to expand the, uh, the cooker operation even a little bit further. Um, I can cook about 30 pounds right now, but only between three cookers. So, um, if I get it up to like six cookers, I think I, I can definitely add that six flavor and no problem. Um, but, um, probably for now, just sticking with the five and then trying out the, trying out the, you know, exclusive ones every once in a while. Um, it seems to keep people, people excited about the new flavors too. Um, I just did a, a Cajun flavor that sold out in a couple of days because we signed a Louisiana's coach over, over on the Gators. So he's coming from there and I made that flavor and, uh, People, people like the tie back to the, the college football stuff and that sold out real quick, but yeah, um, absolutely. I remember that you're a Gators fan. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, okay. So you're going to stick to the flavors. I mean, you're not going to expand the, the flavors to offer more to get the sales up. I mean, so now that it's full time, how do you get the sales up? I mean, are, if it's just five flavors, are you, are you looking to marketing more? Or are you, I mean, what sort of, like, how do you take Spencer 1.0 and go to Spencer 2.0 um, to actually aggressively grow your business now that you're like, I'm all in? Yeah, I really think the, the main step is going to be um, honestly getting into uh, the, the commercial location. Um, and I don't mean like a commercial kitchen, but uh, it needs to be the, the FDA you know, type facility. Um, with an inspector on site, at least, at least that's how it is in Virginia right now. So right now, what kind of keeps me, uh, at bay is, is a few things. Um, one thing is still being the one man show and trying to produce it all fast enough to, to keep up with customer demand, which, um, I've still been able to keep, keep a hold of that. Um, but, uh, with only using commercial kitchen space and doing everything myself, I'm limited to, um, selling direct to consumer. So I'm not able to be a wholesaler. Um, so what that means is technically like the breweries or the grocery stores can't sell it after I sell to them, but I can go stand there and sell it. Um, I can stand right in the brewery and sell it myself. And, uh, the breweries now are still okay with that. I still do that, uh, you know, from time to time, like the events we talked about in the past, um, where I make the smaller packages, uh, which is a transition point where, uh, I definitely want to get my packaging, um, into smaller uh, sizes that are, you know, more cost friendly, um, because, you know, I can look at the numbers and explain it the numbers way, or I can just simplify it and say, you know, not everyone's going to want to spend $25 on beef jerky. They've never seen on a store. You know what I mean? Um, so not everyone takes that leap. So, you know, when I see how many customers are going or potential customers are going on my website versus how many actually, uh, you know, swipe their credit card at the end, you know, there's definitely room for that to, to grow because they're adding it to their cart, but they're not always checking out. Right. So, um, I think finding a way with another co-packer type situation where then it can then be put on shelves and I can start, you know, finding, uh, breweries to actually put it on their shelves and it, you know, it checks, you know, uh, dots its eyes and, uh, you know, crosses its keys. Um, I think that could be a big expansion because like I said, there's so many breweries, so many wineries around here that don't have food. Um, I was selling it at the, at the breweries for a little while. That's how we found out about it. Uh, it's impossible to find the information, but the department of agriculture let us know like, Hey, you have to be here while they're selling it. Um, in order for it to be, you know, proper in Virginia. Um, so that's the, that's the, the biggest thing I have to overcome next is, uh, I think I want to downsize into smaller sizes and then find it where it's done commercially so I can have the FDA stamp and have it actually kind of be sold for me, you know, and then I could really focus, all my time on selling it and marketing it, um, which I think would then take it to even the next step. Whereas now I have extra time that would give me even like a whole nother, you know, 40 hours back in my week. That's awesome. So, I mean, that's the next step then is to sort of commercialize it fully so it can go on shelves, both in retail or in bars or in restaurants, for example. And, I mean, have you started visualizing what your packaging would look like? I've got to imagine you're a pretty creative person. So, I mean, have you started all that? I'm not, you know, obviously not looking to share it, but I'm just 
wondering if, uh, I mean, you sort of build things long term. So have you already started thinking about that and, and designing that out? I've definitely uh, put together tons of different ones over the years, not necessarily like a, a final product. Cause I also don't know, um, I don't know what company um, I want to use um, as far as like to make the bags and everything like that. I have a pretty good idea. Cause I just had a really good experience with the, uh, with a bag company after uh, something arrived damaged, but um, yeah, I don't have a necessarily like a full blown idea. I know it's going to be bright teal uh, like my logo is. Um, that, that part is definitely going to be there. Definitely probably want some cow spots on there. Probably, you know, there, there's this one company that uh, has an awesome logo. Um, and I'm mad that they beat me to it because I've made graphics that look just like it before. It has this, it's this cow with sunglasses and they put the flavor type like in the sunglasses. I don't know if that's the easiest thing to visualize over a podcast, but um, <laughs> they, they got a really cool logo. But yeah, definitely. I want something that's bright and stands out. You know, there's a lot of boring, you know, uh, packaging out there and, you know, you got to catch somebody's eye, especially the beef jerky aisle. You know, there's how many companies in that same aisle. Yeah. And then one of the things we're seeing is there's quite a shakeup with um, with supply chains and stuff like that. So it'll be interesting to see how these companies sort of react, um, particularly in be- something like beef jerky and snack foods as um, shelf stable items that are sort of protein based are going to be more se- um, seeked after more. So I think you're making the right moves. And I think that, um, you know, your logo and stuff like that and the things that you're doing and and how bold it is and how great your flavors are, I think it matters. Um, and I love that it's the original five flavors. I remember trying them during the first episode. Um, and I think you're on to something and I'm really interested to see how you, do the commercialization of your product, um, what next steps you take and sort of how you grow your business. So, I mean, do you find yourself spending more time researching right now? Um, is that where your focus is? Or are you just trying to streamline your website? I mean, how do you take the leap? I mean, any entrepreneurs out there, you've taken the leap. Um, you're talking about the commercialization. So have you been researching? I mean, we're talking about the bag company. So I know you've been obviously doing that but have you thought about like how do i find a relationship who do i reach out to i mean things like that yeah for sure i've I've been doing so i do research all the time so like one of the things i love to do um and this is something i decided to do um just because you know i worked an office job for so many years and you know not to be cliche but you know you dread the mondays right so what i do now is um i bring all my invoices and any of my paperwork and stuff i need to do um, and I go to breweries on Monday afternoons and I do all my paperwork and all my research and everything there um, while, while drinking, you know, some, some beer. And uh, that's made my Mondays a lot, a lot better. And I feel like I research better uh, with a nice IPA. So um, I've been doing that, doing that, a lot of that research. Um, I know I got, life got crazy and I wasn't able to come down, but I have definitely planned on coming down at some point now. Um, I should have more time in the new year um, to check out that facility um, that you guys have. Um, as well. I want to see that. Uh, you've sent me videos over the years of that, that cooker, uh, that you guys have down there. Um, so yeah, I definitely want to come check that out and talk about that too. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think it's really, if you want to come down and see it anytime, and I know there's a lot of, uh, smaller co-packers of beef jerky out there. So that's why I asked, but I, again, I'm not Guess sure what is, what is, what has happened, uh, during COVID. Um, so, um, one of the things I'm, I'm trying to figure out Spencer is, um, like as you go through COVID and as these businesses uh, and you're reaching out to people, I mean, we're seeing it ours is, I mean, what's out there are, are, are people still working as you're researching it? Do you worry about that? Um, are, and how has it been to get your beef? If you go to the grocery store, do you find that it's always there? Cause I think that's another question that some people always have how has that happened do you run into those problems when you go in the grocery store to find your product and and how did you build a relationship with a butcher I think I asked a lot of questions there but I'm sort of wrapped them all into one so yeah um, let's start yeah. with um, one I'm going to say this the brewery thing our videographer and photographer at food service partners and primal rock um, he does the same thing he does a lot of his shoots during the during the morning and then the evening, but in between, 
um, working out and, and other things. He usually does a lot of his editing and his time at a brewery and, and spending time doing that. So he finds the same thing and makes it a little bit easier to do his job and enjoy his job. So totally get that. But the other part of the question that I'll go back to is, did you build a relationship with the butcher in order to make sure you, you could get the meat you want? Or was it something that you just, when you decided it was something, excuse me, you made sure was always there in the grocery store because they already had it? Yeah, uh, it was interesting. I mean, like to go back when like COVID was kind of going crazy, there was a lot of issues um, with going to the butchers. And I was having to go to like, multiple butchers every morning and trying to just grab what they had that day just to have enough to do my orders. Um, and that's what led, cause, um, I don't remember if I talked about this before, but one of the things that I used to do was buy it already sliced and that used to save me hours in my week. Um, but eventually that wasn't feasible anymore. Cause I found out that, uh, everyone was on strike at the factory that was slicing the meat. So that's when I actually started buying my like, I wouldn't necessarily call it commercial, but it's probably in between commercial and like a household, like deli slicer, um, for meat. Um, and that's what started that. Um, I haven't had any issues really since back then. Um, as far as like there being shortages, at least, or at least around here. Uh, but one thing I definitely did was give the butchers uh, free beef jerky and free salsa all the time. Um, just so I wasn't a, a, an annoyance of them necessarily. Cause you know, some of the places it's just an employee, you know, they're not actually the butcher. So they don't really care how much I buy, right. Or how much I ask them to order, how much they slice. So, uh, you know, I had to, you know, grease their palms a little bit with some snacks, um, to, to kind of build that relationship. But, um, I also come in often enough wearing my logo, wearing my hat and, you know, my shirt, and my hoodies. And, um, I'm a small guy. So, you know, when I walk in and I'm, you know, five, eight, one forty, and I'm grabbing, you know, 50 to 60 pounds of steak, I kind of stand out so people notice it. Um, so most of the butchers, uh, you know, I have a good relationship with, um, with the way business is going, I usually have to go to more than one. Um, but I, I've gotten pretty lucky, uh, building some relationships with some good ones where, you know, they'll, they'll, you know, put some stuff in the back, you know, that they don't necessarily need to put out yet, you know, in the hopes that I'm going to show up and grab it before someone else does. So, um, that's definitely been helpful. Yeah. It goes to the point that, every person you meet is a potential customer number one but number two every person you meet is someone you may really need in the future in your business so it's worth building those relationships for the long term for sure oh absolutely and you know the, the one of those times when i'm sitting at the brewery on a monday people will always ask me what in the world i'm doing or they think i work there i'm like no i just sell beef jerky that's a great conversation starter um you know i can't tell you how many sales i get just because i'm like oh, i own a beef jerky company you know, no one's ever like, oh, OK, and no further questions It always there's always at least a couple more questions. Absolutely. And I think a lot of people find this. I think when you travel and you talk about it and you promote your brand as you travel or whatever or wherever you are in a restaurant or whatever, and you make yourself accessible to people and friendly and talk to people, it's a good practice. It's um, having the conversations is what sells your business, not selling your business. Um, you know, and making yourself available to have those relational conversations. It's so important. So I think the environment itself is conducive to those conversations, which is to your benefit and, and why you've seen success in the way that you have. And it'll be interesting to see because I think you have a very loyal fan base around the breweries and, and sort of that environment. And it's so a core part of your brand comparatively to sort of your, you know, you know, Oh, beef jerky, it's a cowboy thing or beef jerky, you know, it's a healthy thing. And yours is healthy because we talked about no sugar. I just want to emphasize that in, in all of your ingredients. But the other part I want to emphasize is that, um, that it's so it, you're making it small batch and it's fresh and wherever you go with whatever co-packer, it'll be interesting to see how they replicate that because I think it's so important to your brand. And I think um, the other piece is, um, which I'm looking forward to, is how you come up with your packaging. I mean, there's a lot out there and I think there's a lot of brands out there. So I'm definitely looking to that because I like your creativity and I, I've loved the way you do your marketing and your advertising and 
and sort of people recognize it and they know it and I'm sort of almost like ringing Pavlov's dog at this point for people to see it and oh I need to order my beef jerky and so that's one of the things I really love about your product I love about your service I love that you give extra to your clients I love that initially you started off with bigger packs because you know there was more value there in shipping and that you also understand you have to go to a smaller pack if you're going to be in retail and so um and I'm looking over at Skylar here. He doesn't have any questions, so I'll keep moving on. I mean, four years later, anything you would tell younger Spencer to old that uh, older Spencer could tell younger Spencer at this point? Yeah, I would. I would probably say, and I, I'm not. I'm not relating this back to um, like making the dive in as far as. Uh, leaving my job because I think it was just the right time when I did that. But I would say that I'd probably just tell myself to like take that chance or, you know, shoot my shot, so to speak, on a lot of the things um, or a lot of the ideas I have sooner. Um, any idea that I've sat on when I eventually do it, it could be just the right timing, but maybe not. Maybe I could have done some of the, some of the moves, you know, you know, sooner. Um, Cause I've just noticed when, when I have an idea and I jump on it, um, it usually seems to move fast and kind of move in the right direction. Um, for example, I, uh, I don't know if you saw, started seeing these ones that I've been posting lately too, Justin, but, you know, going back to, uh, July 1st, uh, college football players in the state of Florida started to be allowed to, uh, get paid for their, uh, name, image, and likeness, right. You know, historically, you know, college football players could only, uh, you know, get their scholarship, get their meal plan, you know, things like that. So um, I honestly posted initially as a joke the night before, uh, oh, so I can sign, you know, an official athlete tomorrow, you know, to Spencer's Jerk and Jerky. And then somebody commented and referenced a, a player on our team who was coming in as a true freshman. Um, and uh, I've had this promo code through one of my podcast sponsorships, uh, you know, people can use this or listen to this too, but if you type in uh, big meat at checkout, it takes off 10%. And that had been a promo code that kind of got legs under it. It was kind of a following. I had merch that said it on there. Um, but anyway, we were signing a, a true freshman who was 6'5 and over 400 pounds. Um, wow. And it, his name's Desmond Watson. And uh, somebody made the connection on Twitter that like he'd be the perfect one to sign. So. Um, I made a tweet about it and he actually reached out to me and was like, if you're serious, like I'm, 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 I'm down. So actually the first day, uh, that it was legal to, uh, you know, sign a player. Um, I signed Desmond as our first, you know, official jerk and jerky athlete. So he's a, he's a defensive tackle, um, at Florida. And what we did is to, to kind of get him some compensation from this, um, Obviously, I sent him a bunch of snacks and, and some some merch, but um, I designed a T-shirt, uh, put his you know name and number on the back of it, and basically just worked it out on my website where I know that every time uh, a shirt is sold, it nets you know a, a specific you know dollar amount per per shirt, and then basically what I do is he gets a hundred percent of that, so um, you know I get some exposure you know. Uh, but then I'm able to give him money, uh, you know, on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, um, driving from these sales of just, you know, just his T-shirts. And, you know, I think we've crossed over 100 of them by now, um, which was was cool to see. Because um, I, 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 I think we might have talked about before is, you know, I ran cross country and track growing up and in college. And, you know, we used to get like three or five dollars, you know, for, for breakfast or lunch. Yeah, no if, we had an away, if, we, if we had an away meet. So. You know, being able to send, uh, you know, a college student who I know doesn't have time to have a job, um, some money, you know, and, you know, money that's off his name, image, image and likeness is kind of a cool thing. So um, I'm that's something I'm definitely exploring more as well uh, and something I think then can give me a lot more exposure. Uh, it's obviously something I love with college football, too, and giving back. But um, that's something I'm looking to expand on too. Uh, you know, coming coming years, coming seasons. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about this a little bit, Spencer, because I think people are like, holy crap, that's a huge move. I mean, how did you come up with a contract and how did you decide to do this and what made you do the leap? Yeah, it it just like sometimes things just feel like they're they're full circle. You know what I mean? And, you know, um, 
the podcast sponsorship I'm referencing, you know, is a strongly uh, revolves around college football. Um, I work on a college, another college football podcast under that same, uh, same network, the roll up network. Uh, um, so it just was all full circle. These are things I'm already talking about and dealing with on a weekly or daily basis. Um, so why not, you know, take this opportunity and, you know, find a way, uh, you know, to compensate him, you know, get myself some exposure, um, even get him some exposure. Um, I can show you, I can show you some time on, online. You'll see, uh, when he gets on the field that everyone starts tweeting at him. Um, and a lot of these people are, are my customers. So it's really cool to see, to see that. And it just honestly just seems like a no brainer. Cause the, 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 you know, the deal we worked out was, Hey, like you, you get everything, you know, anyone, anyone buys this, it, it's, you know, it's, it's yours, you know? So all I had to, you know, all I had to do was spend was, you know, to get it, just get it set up. Right. And, you know, I'm fine. I'm fine doing that. Cause I know that, you know, it's going to find, finding new customers and things like that while, you know, also giving back to, you know, Desmond. Yeah, absolutely. And so I'm looking at them right now online. I see they're in like four colors. You have them in white, black, orange, and blue for them. Is that correct? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The Florida so those colors. The, yeah. Those are the new ones um, that we came out with somewhat recently. Um, you know, I wanted to have something that was a little bit uh, more specific to him versus the original ones just said the big meat on the front and the name and number on the back. So it was kind of mostly, you know, kind of still my, more my, my, uh, my brand. So I wanted to, you know, create something, um, you know, that had more, you know, his touch on it. So that's actually his signature. I had him sign something for me and I, I just, you know, Photoshopped it on there. Um, so I made the, the signature series. So you'll see it has like his character and then, uh, you know, his signature right over it. And then there's also some hats on there that are embroidered, some shorts, um, and stuff like that. And like I said, I fixed it out. So I knew exactly how much each product makes. And then as soon as someone buys one, um, I'm able just to afford him that money uh, for those profits, which is great. That's really cool. Yeah. I see the hats and the shorts on there as well as a, a beanie cap um, yep. for anyone in the audience. And you have a whole merch store, which is really cool. Um, I think anyone who's out there and um, it's really cool. The space cow, um, I love the, the logo and the hoodie. So I think, and I see here, there's also the big meat tie dye shirt. So, uh, the marketing's yep. great. So, um, I, I will say, uh, something that I think is expanded more than anything. Obviously the business has grown over the years as we've been talking and doing these episodes. But, um, I would say like when we first started out, no one was really buying anything as far as like t-shirts off my website, maybe once in a, in a blue moon, but now pretty regularly people buy, buy actually buy merchandise off here, which is pretty, pretty crazy. Um, I actually was in Washington DC to watch a game, uh, the LSU game this year, uh, didn't go as planned, but I walked in and there was a guy wearing one of the shirts. Um, so that's the first time I actually saw somebody out in the wild, had no idea who they were. I was wearing the same shirt. Um, so it was, it was pretty funny. It just had a, a, a it was actually at Gator bar out in the Arlington. Well, it certainly makes makes you have the confidence to want to be like, all right, there's other people that believe in my brand and are wearing it around. <clears throat> this is maybe something I want to do full time. Exactly. So, Spencer, as we wrap things up here and um, we sort of, you know, do another podcast. I Well, I have a few questions, actually, before. One is, what's your favorite flavor of the five, just so the audience knows if they're trying to pick one? And two, what is your favorite uh, flavor that's not of the five sure so um my favorite in most most cases if you ask me is going to be the the habanero bourbon um i'm just a big fan of uh the flavor it gets from the jim bean bourbon but also i use uh which i didn't mention earlier i use a uh, all natural wildflower honey um from busy bees nj um up in new jersey um he sends it right down from his farm. They make it themselves, but the wildflower honey is infused uh, with habaneros that they grow organically on their farm as well. So it has a really nice back end heat uh, without being too much. Sometimes the habanero in, in the in the title scares people away, but I promise it's not nothing crazy like that. Um, if I'm not feeling something spicy, uh, I love my lemon pepper as well. Really depends on the mood I'm in, um, but I really love the lemon pepper as well and. I'm looking at it right now. That one's gone up 55% since last year somehow um, as far as sales are concerned. So uh, those would definitely be my two from the five. 
Um, I'd say habanero bourbon is a, is a close winner. Um, if I had to go with one outside of the five, hmm, I'll probably go with, uh, I made a Jamaican jerk, uh, jerk and jerky. And I've had to do it like three times now because people keep asking for it. Um, and it's not, that's not why it's my favorite uh, limited one, even though that's great. But uh, also because when that kept happening, I actually had to make myself a batch. And uh, something people ask me all the time is, well, how much beef jerky do you eat? And honestly, I don't eat much of it at all um, just because I don't, I don't have the time to, to make myself my own. <laughs> so uh, I made myself a pound of uh, the Jamaican jerk and that's got to probably be uh, without question, my favorite outside of the, the five staple flavors. Yeah, I love it. I'm like the Old Bay one's my favorite for sure. But I will say something interesting. I don't have the data to back this up, but I will say it on the podcast and the world can hear me just in case it ever does um, uh, actually become someone drives the data and proves it's true. It is very interesting. I We are seeing an uptake also in foods related to lemon and citrus and stuff like that as well that we're seeing in terms of requests. And I don't know, but I'm guessing maybe it's COVID, maybe it's something, but the palate in a gener either it's a palate preference in a generation or something to do with the way our palate may have changed um, as we get COVID or coronavirus or the vaccination or something. But the uptake in citrus related foods is big, you know, things like chicken cacciatore or, or anything that's you know, lemon paste or lemon potatoes, we're seeing an uptake across the board as a company. And I know some of our clients are as well. And you just mentioned that it's 50% up. So I was just like, hmm, that's another person that just threw it out randomly. Um, yeah. And yeah, so that's, that's interesting. And so I don't know if it just happenstance, but we, you know, or the way the world shifted, but for sure, um, you know, so if anyone's out there trying something like, you know, we're seeing these trending in certain citrus items, especially things like orange related and lemon and lime uh, in particular, but anything citrus, um, there's a lot of different fruits out there. And we're, and I will tell you as the R and D and the company, I'll let everyone know the, a lot of these random citrus fruits that we don't know about or aren't so exposed to, particularly in the United States are really going to be hitting the ground hard here in terms of going into food, we're seeing different diversity and stuff like that. And in the things like beef jerky and uh, snack foods and pecan flavors and sh all sorts of things. So, um, you know, I'm not the only one noticing that there's an uptake, I would say. And I would say there's other companies out there seeing the same type of success in their lines that have it. So they're investing more. Um, but anyway, just a cool fact that I thought you mentioned that we see as well that I would have normally mentioned if you hadn't mentioned it. So, um, thank you everyone for listening and thank you Spencer for joining us again. Um, love oh, to have you, you down to Milledgeville to see the facility and the beef jerky oven for sure. Anytime. Um, and you can see in there as well, um, beef jerky machines do all sorts of snacks as well. Uh, so it's kind of a cool machine and, um, to the audience, thank you guys for listening in. Thank you to the audience. I know a bunch of you are also now listening in on the Centurion Leadership Italian podcast with Justin Bizarro. Uh, we release two episodes a week at least. Um, there's a lot of new series and sub-series. That one's a little more structured than this one in terms of our content and when we release episodes. Justin the Food Entrepreneurs is more or less, as we record them, we release them at this point. So when, at one time it was structured, but covid kind of messed that whole thing up when i had 60 some people cancel on me in one day uh because they were worried about their business and advertising it during covid so um that was quite the experience when i had a whole schedule for one whole year production just basically wiped off the map um and uh but i will say that um it led to us doing the Centurion Leadership Italian podcast as another podcast in Elena scavendology which is part of the Primal Rock family um, and so on and so forth. So thank you guys for listening in. Check out our other podcasts. Continue to listen in, share, um, spread the word. If you have entrepreneurs in the family, particularly in food, I think these were hugely helpful. And guys, reach out to Spencer again. It's uh, www.spencersjerkinjerky.com. And there's no G in jerkin. It's G, uh, sorry, J E R K I N. Um, 
dot com and you can find him on, at that same address on Instagram and Facebook. So I promise you, if you love Old Bay, the Old Bay Jerk and Jerky is amazing. I promise, um, and I love the lemon pepper as well. So thank you, everyone, again. Give us reviews, um, five star. Hopefully, we could use reviews. We could use downloads. You know, spread the word. Um, we're starting to grow again, which is good. But uh, we need all of your guys' help to get the word out there about all these. Uh, entrepreneurs who are still fighting for food amongst the disaster of the supply chain and the disaster of the food service world. Um, There's still people like Spencer out there fighting to be entrepreneurs and even taking the risk to quit his job. So um, the support is out there. Uh, I mean, sorry, the drive is out there. We just need the support. So thanks again for Spencer for coming on again. And thank you everyone for listening in. Thanks guys.